Welcome to week 22 of Misha and Diane Watch Santa Barbara. Hello. We are starting the final week of the year. The episode we watched was 105, which aired Friday, the 24th of December, 1984. Sorry, Monday, the 24th of December, 1984. So, Christmas Eve. And uh, it hadn't been mentioned up until now that the event at the museum was on Christmas Eve, but it's certainly mentioned by Augusta uh, when they try and arrest Lionel. It adds a little poignancy to the whole story. Mm -hmm. uh, so Cece is happy as Lionel's arrested. Dominic is happy. Lionel tells Augusta to put the logbook under 24-hour guard, uh, and he tells her to send Warren to him immediately. Uh, Lionel spots Dominic, but Mason refuses to go after him. Um, then Augusta goes to blame Eden, mm -hmm. and uh, Mason gloats to Cece about what he's managed, but Cece doesn't forgive him. And then Cece tries to get the logbook. So Augusta's very adamant that the museum keep it under lock and key. Um, Augusta then tells Cece that Eden has been following Lionel around like a lost puppy, mm -hmm. or a lovesick puppy. So that distracts him briefly from the logbook. Mm -hmm. Now Lionel has three cellmates, and he's determined to make this the best Christmas ever. He's having a great old time in prison. Yeah, he's Take, making the most of it. Takes over his cell, calls up Lakin, says it's the uh, Birdman of Santa Barbara here. Mm -hmm. um, then he uh, gets them all to start caroling, and the guards tell him to stop it, but mm -hmm. he says no. And that they have a constitutional right to sing Christmas carols. And uh, then he tells Mason that he will confess to everything if he can have half an hour with Augusta. And somehow she sneaks some champagne in, so they have champagne for half an hour. Um, so that's uh, that's Lionel's Christmas Eve in prison. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the, being the holidays, they say it'll be at least two days before he can get bail. Yeah, we'll definitely see more more scenes, perhaps even many more scenes of Lionel in prison. Mm -hmm. Now, Cece says he can't believe Lionel was as bad as all that. Sorry, mm -hmm. Nathaniel mm -hmm. was as bad as all that. And then Eden says it was all for the love of a woman. Mm. So she kind of thinks it's a romantic story mm. somehow. Uh, Cece says that for all they know, Lionel could have just been making up the words on the spot. Which, which is, is interesting. But, surprisingly but also um, easy to disprove. Accurate, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, then Cece asks Eden about Lionel, you know, mm. have, having heard from Augusta that. Anyway, she says um, that when she falls in love with someone, it will be someone more virile than Lionel Lockridge, which seems to satisfy Cece. Mm -hmm. And Eden says, it'll be someone just like Dad. So she knows how to play her dad. Yep. I don't know if I would say he's more virile no, than Lionel. No, I wouldn't though. say. <laughs> he's about Not this 20 in years older looking. Anyway, but. Uh, Lakin apologizes to Ted, and they dance. So that's pretty much all they, mm -hmm. they have in this episode. Uh, Kelly and Joe exchange gifts. Joe gets a last minute Christmas tree. She says it was $25 instead of 75 because his dad always told him to get his trees on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. um, Mason comes over to get their whole uh, side of the coin story. Mm -hmm. um, they tell him all the things they thought, of course saying that they thought it was Warren, and then Mason says, no, it, it was Lionel. Mm -hmm. um, then later at the police station, again, Dominic calls Mason and tells him to search Lionel's tuxedo. Yeah. So Mason has the tuxedo brought, but he also has them check on former Lockridge gardeners. Yeah, he's getting a little suspicious. I don't think it's necessarily that he wants to help Lionel so much, but he is. it is... You know, even at the, after three phone calls, it is starting to look a little like a frame. Yeah, and I think Mason, it's interesting, Mason never lets on when he's talking with Lionel or any Lockridge's mm -hmm. that that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. But clearly, it should be the first thing in his mind if yeah. someone phones about gold coins. and then, Yeah. So, um, he concludes that someone is trying to frame Lionel. Mm-hmm. 
So, because uh, they call the the Lockridge Gardeners, and they yeah. they say no, we we left a couple of years ago, but there was no ill will, and yeah, and uh, so I think Mason, Mason knows it's a frame up, but uh, I think he he could still drag his feet on releasing Lionel anyway. Well, especially if Lionel does, in fact, confess to everything. Exactly. He has an excuse for leaving Lionel. Yeah. Um, so he very quickly finds the bloody note that Sophia hid in mm -hmm. the lining of the jacket. And uh, he has the blood type checked, and it matches the blood type of Channing. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, of course, before more complex DNA tests would mm -hmm. have been available, but... A blood test would have been, mm -hmm. especially if Channing had a rare blood type or something. I forget what they said it was AB or something. Yeah. So, if they put that in our database of information we know about the Capwells and Lockridge's mm -hmm. blood types. And that was pretty much it. I mean, we glossed over a lot of argument arguments between various people, like Augusta and Eden, Augusta and Lionel, Ted and various family members, but that was the gist of what happened in this episode. There was uh, there was one uh, scene that reminded me a little bit of a previous scene, and that was where um, Cece is insisting on viewing the logbook and, you know, being able to handle it and whatever, and uh, Augusta basically saying, no, it's our property. And... Um, CC's obliviousness on this point to me really echoed his obliviousness on the status of the shipwreck mm -hmm. deal at Amanda Lockridge and the fact that if someone has rights to a shipwreck, then not everyone can just go stomping around on it and mm -hmm. removing things from it. So CC definitely has a bit of a blind spot towards this sort of thing, which I do find a little bit surprising in you know, someone who's a titan of, of industry. And mm -hmm. He says to Augusta, that was a hundred years ago. As yeah, if, like that as doesn't As if they have matter. no rights to it anymore. Yeah. Know? So, yeah, and he tries to bully the um, museum chief to, yeah. uh, to release the, the logbook into his custody, which I don't think anyone would want to do, uh, based on what they've already heard, read, read from the log, logbook. I think everyone probably would keep it from Cece. I mean, I could see him knowing that, but playing the hand anyway. But uh, at least this version of CC genuinely doesn't seem to, to understand this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, Kelly didn't have any headaches while she was with Joe. So no, nice. they were just stringing together popcorn to decorate their tree, and neither yeah. of them particularly thrilled to see Mason, and... No one it seems to ever be particularly thrilled to see Mason, but... Joe really hasn't been it. present when she's had the headaches at all. It looks no. It's like he's got a, she's got a separate storyline. Yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. kind of interesting. Um, tomorrow's Christmas, so we'll see how the Capwells enjoy their Christmas. The yeah. The Lockridges will, at least some of them, be in jail. Warren never did show up after mm -hmm. being ordered to, to come back, so... Who knows if he's uh, rushed off to L.A. to find Summer, or if he will show up in the prison. And then, of course, Lionel may may have by then heard about the note in the tuxedo, and realizing it was Warren's tuxedo, he may have something else to ask Warren about uh, that he didn't pre previously. That's probably why they delayed Warren's arrival, so that the tuxedo information can make it to Lionel, too, before Warren shows up. So... And that is about it. So we'll be back after we watch episode 106 of Santa Barbara. Bye-bye. Welcome back to Mission Diane Watch Santa Barbara. Hello. We just watched episode 106 of Santa Barbara. Originally aired Tuesday, December 25th, 1984. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We for completely forgot to mention last time about the special closing credits, which were... Uh, done over um, Cece reading Brandon's Christmas card. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. um, And then today we'll have a, we'll have a special one as well. Uh, now Cece has brought a lot of presents for Brandon. Brandon spends basically the whole day opening up things, the yes. biggest one being a car. Mm-hmm. That looks kind of fancy. And I thought it was kind of interesting, and different families have different traditions, but... Uh, 
basically CC and Gina come down with Brandon and Brandon just starts going at the presents and uh, certainly in in our family usually everyone in the family gets together uh, to open presents and uh, we don't see any of the other Capo kids so no no it's just Brandon on his own tearing through presents yeah at one point CC goes faster faster yeah <laughs> <laughs> so Gina kisses CC on the cheek yeah and reminds him of how they first met when she mm -hmm. was caddying for Stockman and he landed a helicopter on the green. That's right. He needed some documents signed. Uh, Mason shows up with a present for Brandon. CC tries to not let him in, but Mason gets in. And we have another of these sort of odd little moments with CC where um, Mason hints that there may be developments in the case. and. CC demands to know what they are, and, and Mason has to remind him that it is police business. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Another odd little moment from CC. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if Mason's actively pursuing the, you know, uh, the, the tipster mm -hmm. angle and isn't really thinking that Lionel's guilty at this point. So. Well, I, I do think, and I mean, we'll certainly talk about this a little bit more, the developments in this episode, but I, I do think perhaps Dominic is pushing it a little bit. But, you know, there's just so many clues now from the Lockridge house coming fast and furious that it is actually perhaps a little bit of overkill on her part. Mm -hmm. So Rosa and Ruben also arrive uh, with a gift for Brandon from Santana. It's a camera. Mm -hmm. She says she wants him to send photos every once in a while so she can watch him grow. So it sounds like she's planning on not coming back. Yeah, and CC looks very uncomfortable at this entire in this entire scene. Mm -hmm. And CC proudly hands Ruben and, Rusa, Ru Ruben and Rosa an envelope, and uh, Ruben rejects it. Yeah, and Ruben basically um, tells CC he doesn't want his money. And we've commented before on the fact that Ruben is one of the few characters in this who sort of has the moral authority and is a, actually in many ways a peer of CC and can actually face him down, even though he's of a much lower uh, socioeconomic status. It's interesting. Uh, the last time we saw Robin, he was Ruben. He was telling CC, uh, "We'll decide if we want to continue working for you." Mm -hmm. And then the mm -hmm. first thing they say when they come in is, "We're just here to bring a gift." Yeah. So, uh, not clear. Did they somehow maybe quit? We don't know. I don't know. But CC looks looks kind of stunned because he's not used to being challenged at all like this. And we've seen Cruz challenge him a little bit as well over the last um, epi few episodes of the series when Cruz has been on. But but Ruben, it comes from a very particular place. They're men of the same age. They have children of the same age. And, you know, as I say, Ruben has a, a sort of um, gravitas to, to him that mm -hmm. CC can't really, he, he can't bluster through. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jade and Marissa have turned the Perkins dining room into a nursery. Yeah. And uh, Ruben and Rosa arrive there with gifts. So, it's the first time I think probably Amy and Jade and Marissa have ever had a scene with Rosa and Ruben. Yeah, yeah, and, and it seems like they actually know each other quite well. I mean, I guess they're sort of from the um, same strata in society, you know, I, I think Marissa works in the kitchen at, at Jade's school, mm -hmm. and it seems like they've known each other for a while. Now, we know that Cruz and, and Joe were good friends um, mm. years yeah, back. Because Marissa opens yeah. her gifts and she says, oh, you're famous Quince Jam. Yeah. So she knows Rosa, you know, Rosa's jams. And it may be, too, now that Joe has been exonerated, you know, we know that Santana was um, very fiercely against Joe when she thought that he had killed Channing, but it, it could be as well that now that Joe's exonerated, that maybe whatever relationship was there before Channing's death is maybe it's been rekindled a little bit with uh, Reuben and Rosa and, and the Perkins family. 
Mm-hmm. But it was nice. It was nice to see them together. We haven't seen that that group of characters together before. Yeah, Reuben mentions that the Perkins gave them water uh, during the yes, earthquake. Yes, that's right. So, um, Amy says she'll name the baby John if it's a boy, mm-hmm. which I predicted as soon as she started yes. talking about baby names uh, yes. with Jade. And then Jade asks if it would be gross to give Danny a date with her as a Christmas gift. Because she reiterates to Amy she likes him just as a friend. Yeah, it's, uh, well, it definitely makes the assumption that he would view that as a, a valuable gift. Mm-hmm. We will see. Yeah. Um, now, Lionel has given all his cellmates Christmas stockings somehow overnight. Yeah. He's got a lot of uh, a run of that prison. Um, now, Sid, who's uh, one of the, the other three men, is Mr. Carlin uh, from the Bob Newhart show, Jack yeah, Riley. Yeah, and he's not actually credited in this episode, but we recognize yeah, him. Yeah, that's true. There was only one other extra credit, and it wasn't him. Uh, Mason receives uh, an anonymous package at the Capwell presidential suite, where he's still living. Mm-hmm. And uh, it starts with him listening to I'll Be Home for Christmas, which he clearly won't be. Um, so then there's a one inch videotape in there as well as, um, as a note saying, Oh, now that you know that you're looking for a murderer, you should research that house and look for different things. So, uh, Mason then also gets a call uh, from the lab saying they've matched the fingerprints that were found on the side of the desk the night Channing was killed. Mm -hmm. So... One assumes that means they found a print of Lionel's, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. though maybe it's a print of Warren's. Who knows? Mason may have sent all the Lockridge fingerprints in yes, to be compared. Yes, a hold of them. So there may be a twist that, that Mason has in his head that we don't know about. Lionel is the one who would have provided his fingerprints. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's true. Because he got arrested. So that's why I would assume it was Lionel's. Mm-hmm. It wasn't explicitly out. said, I don't think so. Could be still a loophole there. Mm-hmm. So Mason gets another warrant, and the only person home is the new gardener. Yeah. And he kind of uh, bulldozes his way past him. And they almost accidentally find a ring hidden in a skull, Mm -hmm. uh, which has LL and SC in it. Lionel Lockridge and Sophie Capwell. So the C is Capwell. This Mm -hmm. is after she's married to Lionel. Yes. Uh, uh, CC. So Mason recalls having seen the ring before. Now, I'm trying to think. Did we see that ring before? Yeah, I don't remember. Um, I I mean, it depends on where Mason saw it before. If it was something that he saw floating around the Capwell house, I suppose he could make the case that was another thing that was stolen. Was it the ring Warren and Channing were arguing about? Maybe. Didn't Channing take a ring from someone, or maybe it was Lionel? Maybe. In one of the flashback scenes? Maybe that's the ring. I mean, regardless, it seems to me that it would have to be one connected somehow with the Capwells. Because if it's one he saw Lionel wearing, it's Lionel's ring, he's in Lionel's house, that wouldn't really mean much, except that he had an affair with Sophia, which Mm -hmm. isn't against the law. So it must be something that is somehow connected with the, the Capwell house. The cap was. One thing we didn't mention yesterday is um, that Joe and Kelly t- told Mason that the coins, Sophia's coins, were originally given to her by Lionel. Mm-hmm. So that's something that Mason found out yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So uh, back in the prison, Minx brings cookies for Lionel uh, in her purse, and mm-hmm. the guard said, Oh, I need to check those. And she says, Oh, I. You know, you don't need to check these. They're cookies. So the guard opens it up, and there's a pistol in the tin. <laughs> she said, oh, yes, that's in case someone tries to steal my cookies. So he confiscates the pistol and kicks her out immediately. Uh, on her way out, a prisoner, played by Rudy Valley, recognizes Minx from 50 years earlier. Mm-hmm. As did you used to tra- take the train from Santa Barbara to San Francisco every week for about six months? Mm-hmm. She says yes, but she doesn't. She can't place him, apparently. Um, Lionel, um, when Warren finally arrives, Lionel tells Warren not to say anything. 
um, about him being the one who took the coins because uh, he says, you know, we're, we're being set up here, so just play it cool until we figure out what's going on. But he says people, you know, he got rid of those coins, and so they were planted mm -hmm. in his uh, attaché case. And um, he thinks he knows who, who it is, but obviously he doesn't know how to yeah. find them. So. Yeah. Um, back at the house, Lakin tells Augusta, talks to Augusta about finally being in the loop regarding the coins, and mm -hmm. she, doesn't, she wants her to tell the family to tell her everything in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and Minx arrives and announces they'll have Christmas dinner at the prison. And uh, she says, well, bring a goose. And Augusta says, I made a turkey. <laughs> so then they show up at the prison with a folding table and folding chairs and uh, a goose or a duck. No, it was well, a turkey. I think turkey. they did end up with a turkey. Yeah. And then uh, Minx invites all the other prisoners into the cell. And then she invites the guards, too. And Augusta says, I don't know if we have that much food. And mm -hmm. Lyon says, well, we don't have to don't have to eat like pigs. We, we could probably make it mm -hmm. make it last. And then the Rudy Valley prisoner sits down next to Minx and talks a little bit about how he was a, I don't think he said conductor, he said some some sort of a bus boy or something mm -hmm. working on that on that train that she used to take every week. So it sounds like they never talked. Yeah, but uh, he had sort of all. admired her from afar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting... That Cece has basically no family for Christmas in his big mansion with mm -hmm. all the gifts and everything. And Lionel, who's in prison, has his whole family with him and is happy. And they're all having a good time. And he's got all the other prisoners and the guards and they're all celebrating. Yeah, I mean, it, I, that struck me too. And of course, we've got poor old Mason in the mm. presidential suite all by himself. Mm -hmm. We don't see Kelly Every, and Joe again, but we're assuming they're having a nice romantic Christmas. Everyone who showed up at yeah. Cece's house did something to make him a little more miserable that day. Yeah. yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, dichotomy between the Capwells and the Lockridges. Mm -hmm. His, Cece's children are nothing but a cause of trouble for him. <laughs> so and then we had another special closing credits. Uh, most of the regular cast, the current, the cast that were in this episode had stills from the episode. Mm -hmm. um, while we could hear some uh, jingle bells over the credits, mm -hmm. and then we wish you a Merry Christmas. And then people who weren't in this episode, they had stills from, from mm -hmm. other episodes. That so it was, it was almost like, um, it, well, it was really all these little still photos from throughout the run of, of the show, really. Um, I didn't spot Dane Witherspoon. I was going to say, yeah, I didn't see Dane Witherspoon, but all of the other characters, I would say, or, or many of them, are represented. So we see Cruz, even though we haven't seen him for a couple of episodes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we see Danny, even though we haven't seen him for a couple of episodes. So they're, they're well represented. And Ava Lazar is still in the credits. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And we had a reference to uh, Twisted Sister. Yep. As Jade mentions that she gave a great Twisted Sister tape to her friend Kathy, and all she got was some awful earrings. So this would have been the zenith of Twisted Sister. I guess they had that one song. So now we can pinpoint exactly when they were popular and how, <laughs> how that intersects with the show. When Mason brings the gift uh, for Brandon, CC says, uh, why are you bringing Brandon the gift? He goes, well, uh, since he's getting my share of your inheritance, I might need a loan from him someday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I'm wearing the closest thing I could find to uh, Lionel's prison shirt um, in honor of that. Uh, in the real world, of course, in 1984, uh, Christmas, my mother said, oh, what are you guys doing tomorrow? And I was like, oh, I might go see Kevin or something. And my mom says, oh, because we're going to Hawaii tomorrow. Oh, wow. So, December 26, 1984, I was in an airplane headed for Hawaii and obviously would have missed the next episode of Santa Barbara. So mm. when we watch it, probably right after this, it'll be the first time I've seen episode 107. Well, my memory would be in the real world, in around this time in 1984, I believe would have been when Band-Aid was formed and came out with Do They Know It's Christmas. Uh -huh. 
we should uh, we should do a little summary of uh, mm-hmm. things, movies, and songs from '84 before mm-hmm. before the year ends. But for now, we will be back after we watch episode 106 of Santa Barbara. See ya. Bye. Bye. Aloha. Hello. We're in Hawaii. <laughs> we arrived at 2 a.m. Hotel room was not ready. Um, so I missed today's episode of Santa Barbara 35 years ago, but I saw it now, episode 107 from the 26th of December, 1984. Mm-hmm. Augusta describes the ring to Lakin and Warren, and Warren says that that sounds like a ring Dad used to have. Uh, then when he leaves Lake and says to Augusta, she thinks Warren uh, knows something that she's not telling them. Mm-hmm. Something important. Ted shows up and tries to talk Lake out of going to the hearing. Says, oh, we should just take the boat out. Mm-hmm. But she wants a goat to go. They talk about their future and getting married, and including baby Minx. Yeah. Which must be a little like baby Yoda, I guess. Um, and they decide to go to the hearing, and he says, well, you know, Keep this separate from us. Mm-hmm. Uh, now Veronica spent the night with Mason. And uh, he's working on the brief with one hand. and He's got the ring out in the open and he's on the phone with the other. Mm-hmm. Talking to the DA. About the new charges. Yeah. Then he has a flashback to the ch- day with Channing. And we finally we see him in the... Actually we've seen him in the study once before in a flashback. But this mm-hmm. is him, him talking to Channing. Mm-hmm. And Channing says he knows what Mason and Pamela are up to. So I think that's new information, unless I'm blanking. Um, then uh, back in the presidential suite, Mason views the tape Dominic sent him, mm-hmm. which is the discussion Lionel and Augusta and Lakin and possibly Warren had at mm-hmm. the museum. Mm-hmm. So Mason's really excited about how his case is just being handed to him. Just Coming together. Mm-hmm. It did occur to me that, well, first of all, I, I I wouldn't be entirely sure that videotape would be legally admissible evidence, depending on, you know, kind of the laws around, well, wiretapping or taping or that kind of thing. Not every jurisdiction recognizes it, and it wouldn't have been an official tape mm-hmm. recording. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I, I th- thought it was a, a little odd that, the ring is just sort of sitting there in his briefcase, and he's looking at it. You know, it hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been processed into evidence or anything mm-hmm. like that. So, yeah, that's um, true. Veronica spots it. Yeah, it does just seem uh, a little cavalier the way he's treating evidence in this important case. Mm-hmm. So Veronica leaves and immediately goes to tell Lionel everything she learned, but says that she doesn't want to. Lie to Mason. He says, oh, that's fine. You know, we don't need to lie to him. I'll be out of here by this afternoon. Mm-hmm. And then Mason walks in, just as she's telling him something. So Lionel uh, covers for her by pretending that he was trying to bribe her with $20,000 to mm-hmm. tell him about Mason. Yeah. And uh, Mason buys it and ends up apologizing to Veronica. Yeah, so Mason, or uh, so Lionel still has his ally on the inside. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lionel asked Veronica to come over that night. Um, and then Warren comes to visit. And Lionel tells him all about the affair with Sophia, all yep. about the accident. Um, and swears they didn't murder Sophia. Mm-hmm. And uh, all about Dominic and his wife trying to railroad him. Yeah. So now Warren has all that information. Back at the Capwell house, Gina is trying to exert control over Rosa, taking the tray in to Cece instead of Rosa. And Rosa's pretty annoyed, it looks like, that Gina's trying to take over the house. Uh, at one point, the doorbell rings, and a reporter shows up and claims to be named Clark Griswold, <laughs> which we all know is Chevy Chase's character from the Vacation movies. So mm-hmm. uh, we can only assume that the reporter was using a fake name, Mm -hmm. thinking that the Capwells would be too highbrow to know who Clark Griswold was. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Eden watches Gina interact with the reporter and then puts her down with some slide rem snide remarks. Uh, Gina says, oh, you have to go down to their level. And Eden says, well, you certainly did that. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting, the interaction first with Rosa, where Gina's insisting on taking the tray and, you know, um, getting the meal preparation uh, plans from from CC and that. Uh, Rosa's got a routine where she brings in his coffee, they discuss breakfast, they set the day's menu. And I thought what was particularly awkward about this whole interaction, and I think maybe shows that Gina's trying, trying to find her way in, is that on the one hand she's trying to take over Rosa's job basically by taking in the coffee and doing the order and that. And then she kind of flips it and starts giving Rosa orders. Mm -hmm. So she she hasn't really quite gotten quite the right positioning yet. Yeah. She's and and maybe this also shows a little bit about her own upbringing, which is obviously not as privileged. So she she's trying to sort of find the right balance, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I think um, when she dismisses the reporter, obviously. Eden is not impressed with her, and she's kind of watching the interaction with Rosa. She's not impressed, and she's not impressed at all with how Gina handles the reporter. And, and I would imagine it's not really said at all, but I, I would imagine perhaps what Eden is thinking is that if the reporter had been handled um, in a way that was maybe a little more savvy, they could nurture more of a, a positive relationship with the press you know that would perhaps be a way that Eden's thinking about it whereas just throwing them off the property you know if the Catwells ever need positive press that's not going to help with mm -hmm. that. The other thing um, sort of subsequent to this that Eden mentions to CC is she asks him how much he really knows about Gina and I thought that really touched on a soft spot that we've seen a few times. And, and I was thinking to myself, well, how much did they ever know about Peter? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it seems to be a weakness that CC um, gets taken in by a certain type of, of grifter or a certain type of person and, and actually doesn't do the background research and doesn't ask questions. Yeah, Elizabeth. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Joe, obviously, first thing they did was investigate him, probably. So. Exactly. Seems like if you seem to be their kind of person, mm -hmm. they don't look uh, too far. That's right. And uh, I think it, it, it also speaks to Eden's ability that she is asking these questions. And, and one of the things Veronica mentions to Mason is that Eden is a, is a tough boss. She, I, it doesn't sound like she's unfair or whatever, mm -hmm. but it sounds like she really expects people to be on top of things and is on top of things herself and and we can actually see that she is probably quite competent at her job mm -hmm. and she is asking the right questions mm -hmm. uh, Dominic give, gives Mason another call just yeah. to make sure all the nails are in the coffin and um, Mason says oh you know what you and your wife should come in uh, and uh, I can give you a proper interview on these things. And uh, Dominic says, oh, she got scared, she left town, and uh, then hangs up. So, um, yeah, basically, it's not a useful call for either of them, except no. Mason, it's clear, I would think, to Mason now that, that this is a setup of Lionel, but he's still plowing ahead with everything. Well, I think he's in a place where he's just kind of grateful to have this case handed to him. I think he really wants to um, go ahead with that, and maybe he'll ask some questions later, but I think he's quite delighted to get all this information handed to him, and he's going to, as you say, plow ahead. At one point, uh, when Mason leaves Channing and... Uh, sorry, leaves Warren and Lionel together, in the interrogation room, Mason says to Warren, oh, you'll be... He'll be on the other side of that table soon enough, and, and that's kind of glossed over. But that yeah. makes it sound like Warren is, uh, or Mason maybe is trying to piece together what part of the crimes he can charge Warren with. Yeah, yeah. 
So uh, Warren and Lyon will talk about the day Channing was killed and uh, how Channing took the ring from Lionel, and then later Warren saw Channing with the, the same ring. So they realized they both had it out with, with Channing that day. Mm -hmm. And then uh, everyone gathers for the hearing, and CC even arrives, having previously told Eden he didn't want to witness it. And then uh, Warren is brought in, and Mason arrives late, which annoys the judge at first. But then Mason says, oh, there's been a change. Uh, the DA now wants... Um, Lionel charged with first-degree murder, mm. and the bail is being requested at $5 million. And that shocks everyone in the courtroom. Yeah. And that is our end of the day. And we got to see two really nice little flashbacks in this episode, uh, one with uh, Channing and, and Lionel, and one with Channing and Mason. And I really like the way they've done these flashbacks. I, I think I noted this um, when we saw the ones with Peter and Warren as well, because they kind of put a little gloss on it. And then for the one with Mason, they've kind of got him in a little sort of sweater and polo outfit, which makes him look a little bit younger. Mm. And then with um, Lionel, they've I think they've added a, a little bit of darkness to his hair. So, mm -hmm. And with mm -hmm. Warren's, I think they slicked his hair back a bit to make him look. It yeah. looks shorter. Lionel's hair kind of looked gray today, but that's because they had a filter on the camera yeah. as well this time. Yeah. Because I'm sure last time he had the darkened hair, although there's the Sophia flashback too, where his hair is black. Yeah. And, uh, and the Channing flashback, his hair is darker. But uh, they do, they have, anyway, they have made an attempt with these flashbacks to, to make the characters look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that, and I... Um, the actor they have playing Channing, who is a thoroughly unlikable character. So again, very every time I see one of these flashbacks, I'm really struck by how different he is in the flashbacks than he is certainly in the telling of Cece or Santana or a lot of the other characters. But he does look like he could be the brother of Kelly and Eden. They've found an actor who looks very similar to them. So I yeah. think that works as well. Got that blonde... Here. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Ted this time says he's, I think he says to Mason, well, I'm, I may never be as good as Channing, uh, which is interesting. I mean, obviously he's talking about things like his polo mm -hmm. winnings and whatever, but uh, Mason doesn't actually, you know, counter it in a way that he could have. Well, I, I think one of the things, um, you know, kind of to continue with that theme in, that we heard a bit about in this episode is that Ted is not really a scholar. He has all D's, apparently. He was mm. telling Lakin today. So I think he was, that's probably just part of what he was saying with Mason, is that, you know, he's not going to be the guy on the polo team. He's not going to be the guy winning a scholarship to Harvard. I mean, he might get it as a legacy candidate, but he's not going to be the high achiever that Channing apparently was. Or I guess that Mason is as well. When they're talking about their future, he, he says, well, you know, Lakin can be the model slash yeah. lawyer of the family. Yeah. So. And that is about it. I'm wondering if um, Mason's going to maybe try to charge Lionel with the murder and then go ahead and charge Warren with the theft so he can get them both. I, I suspect they'll do something like to. that. Because if you look at the, the little videotape that Dominic, sent him, and we didn't see it all, but we did see the scene play out, you know, a couple episodes ago. They're definitely talking about the coins, and it's very obvious from that the conversation they're having that they know about the coins, and that they had them, and they didn't think they had them anymore. So it makes it very obvious that Lionel and Warren both knew about the coins, and they're kind of planning together, or they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're strategizing together. So... I think that will be very much um, possibly a case that Mason will, will try to make. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see. The next episode is episode 107 from December 27th as we head towards New Year's Eve. So we'll be back after we watch episode 107. Bye-bye. Aloha! Hello! We have just watched episode 108 of Santa Barbara, which aired Thursday, the 
27th of December 1984 and uh, there's quite a chance that I watched it in the Waikiki Banyan. Ah! Um, it would so have been pretty hot at 2 p.m. on the beach so I may have taken a couple hours ah, break from swimming. I was going to say that's what someone does. They go on vacation in Hawaii to watch soap operas yeah. on TV. Exactly. Especially after missing the trial episode. Mm -hmm. So Mason announces the murder charge on the high bail, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was five million, but then later they I only had to raise... I thought it was five million too. Maybe the judge changed it to 500,000. Yeah. Um, Lionel spots Dominic and tells Warm to go after him. Um, then Lionel shouts that Cece and Mason have set him up. Um, now they never mention that he's been charged with Channing's murder, but he says, I didn't kill Channing. So I'm not sure why they glossed over that. No one seems to be surprised that it's Channing they're talking about. No, no. Um, but uh, given we've talked so much about him inadvertently killing Sophia, it actually was possible they had dug up some evidence on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we didn't know what Mason had. Yeah, that's right. So Cece tries to strangle him. Um, Mason then tells Cece that the reason for the murder was that Lionel was trying to cover up the fact that he and Sophia had had an affair, mm -hmm. which uh, Cece doesn't believe at all. Yeah. So Mason has to show him all the evidence. And, that, and then um, um, Cece thinks that Lionel maybe blackmailed Sophia into having the affair. And uh, Cece, Lionel, uh, Mason is waiting for his apology from Cece, and Cece says, for what? So Ma Mason is uh, not too happy about that, and Cece says that Mason is disgusting or something similar. And uh, Cece stalks out, and Mason says, "Well, I probably, I probably should have guessed it was going to go that way." And Eden tries to console him a bit, but um, he says basically he's gonna, he's just gonna move on with his life. He's got mm -hmm. two plans: one to make sure Lionel is found guilty. And one to take over as head of the Capwell family from CC. Mm -hmm. So who knows what that could entail? Uh, he doesn't really have much money. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has some money, but um, is is he planning to take over Capwell Enterprises somehow? Because he's going to need a lot more capital than that, or have CC declared incompetent and then somehow try to get control of the board? I mean, Eden would probably have a better shot. So. Well, I, I have to say the declaring CC incompetent doesn't look quite as unrealistic after this episode. Mm. Um, I think this is one of the dumber iterations of CC because in this episode we see him trying to strangle Lionel in a court of law, mm -hmm. which, you know, is, is particularly stupid given that they've pretty much got Lionel, you know, cornered mm -hmm. legally. Mm hmm and then we see him sort of storming around all episode, refusing to believe that Sophia could possibly have had an affair. And then, of course, subsequently blaming all of his kids for not being loyal enough to him. And so mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's, it's just not a good look. And uh, the other thing I noticed during this um, scene with Mason is that you know, as as we pointed out last episode, Mason seems quite cavalier about the handling of evidence. And here we see CC pawing away at the photograph and the ring. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, none of this stuff is in lockup. So it just, uh, it does seem very slipshod for the deputy district attorney. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I did want to also note, though, that we do see some really nice scenes between some of the actors, and I, I actually did think Cece and Mason had a nicely played scene, even though I thought it was, you know, it didn't show Cece in a good light. We, we do see Cece getting quite teary and uh, Mason getting teary. And then we do see a, a really beautiful scene later, which I know you'll probably talk about a bit more between uh, Lakin and Tad. And I just thought it was really nice acting in some of those scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as part of the, uh, during the discussion about Cece 
uh, where Cece refuses to believe Lionel and Sophie even knew each other. Yeah. Mason mentions that they worked on a film together and they're yeah. both in the same credits. <laughs> yeah, which exactly. Seems to have shocked Cece. And they've been neighbors for like 40 years. So. Mm hmm. Now, Kelly dreams about her mother and the earthquake. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a reference to the fact that Dominic was in that same collapsed building with her. Yeah. Uh, somehow, her subconscious is trying to tell her something. Dominic comes over uh, to tell them that Lionel has been arrested. And then uh, she says something to calm down Kelly. I forget the exact phrasing. Something like, it'll be all right, or my child, or something. Um... Then Dominic leaves, and Warren comes bursting in shortly after, having followed Dominic from the courthouse, mm -hmm. uh, demanding to know who Dominic is, and uh, Ted and Kelly are a little bit, you know, reticent about giving up their friend's info, but Warren says, you know, your friend set up my dad for the murder of Channing. So yeah. I think they're a little bit shocked by that, and when Warren leaves, Kelly says, well, we don't really know anything about Dominic. Well, and I think even before Warren came in, you could see Kelly was a little bit perturbed by Dominic's demeanor, which was so triumphant at the downfall of Lionel Lockridge. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in all of this investigation, you know, especially if you think of the earlier episodes that Kelly and Joe were were participating in with Dominic, I'm not sure Lionel ever really came up that much on the radar. So for him suddenly to be the center of um, all of this, this, of this investigation and for Dominic to be so weirdly happy about it, I think, you know, Kelly has picked up on something not being quite right. Mm -hmm. And um, after listening to Warren and then chatting with Joe a little bit, I th think she's definitely feeling that there is a problem with Dominic mm -hmm. and of course as you say she is having these flashbacks as well that Dominic happens to use exactly the same phrase she remembers hearing um, I don't know if it was a nurse or, or one of the women around her saying when she was mourning her mom's death so I guess what we maybe have learned from this is that perhaps after um, being hit by the boat and coming out of it that Sophia posed as maybe some help or maybe a nurse or something and was there at her own She care. said it was at her mother's grave. It yeah. could have been you know, weeks later too. Could yeah, have that's right. It could have been the day of the funeral. That's right. Um, but yeah, Kelly does remember that actual phrase from her dream, mm -hmm. from her recent dream. Mm -hmm. So she thinks it's odd that... Dominic would use that phrase from her dream. Yeah. Um, Joe is more reluctant, actually, because Dominic is the only one who believed in him for the longest yeah, time. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, he spent five years, and Kelly didn't believe in him, mm -hmm. you know, for that matter. So I can see Joe, I think, has an innate sense of loyalty, and I, I can see him not wanting to... He's not dismissing it. Like, he just says, you know, let's just think about this and really think through you know, what Warren is telling us and, and what we're sort of observing ourselves. And, and uh, yeah, I, I can see he's not the kind of person who's just going to suddenly change his mind. Um, later on, Joe brings Kelly roses. This is a second set of flowers we've seen mm -hmm. him bring her since those carnations in the hospital. When yeah. He just left her one. Um, Cece forbids Ted from seeing Lincoln again. Uh, he says actually he forbids everyone in the family for, from having anything to do with the Lockridge. So Ted leaves with Lincoln, and they go to the yacht, the Capwell yacht, and they talk about Channing, and, uh, Ted, Ted talks about how, you know, when he, when his mother died, that Channing was his only friend, and was kind of like a mom to him, and also that the only way he could get a, his head around Joe Perkins killing Channing was to think that Joe just went crazy. Yeah. And so since Joe was exonerated, his, you know, he's just wanted to know, well, who, who killed Channing. So we kind of dance around the fact that Lionel's, you know, now up for that. And Lincoln says, well, you believe my dad's innocent. And he, says, and he says, I want to. Yeah. So that's where they leave it, I think. 
I, I really like this scene, as I say, not only because I thought the acting was very affecting in it, but also because um, Ted's offering a really, I think, genuine uh, memory of, of Channing that, frankly, is not being evident at all in the flashbacks. And um, everyone, you know, when CC and Santana talk about what a great person he is, it's well, as I say, when you look at the flashbacks, it, it doesn't match. But also, it's it's kind of like they've put a halo around him, whereas Ted mm -hmm. is, is offering very specific memories and very specific examples of how Channing was good to him when he was a kid. And I found those quite believable, and, and I thought that gave another dimension to Channing's character and at least as far as Ted was concerned maybe he did have a sort of uh, a, a tender spot for Ted mm -hmm. that we have as we've seen in the flashbacks he did not have for many characters in this at all I think he said that Channing was eight and he was four when Sophia died or, did or he? As he said he was two I think was two okay yeah um, now Cece asks Eden why she wasn't more shocked at the hearing and, uh, of course, we're thinking about Sophia and Lionel. Yeah. But she says, oh, I, I didn't know anything about the murder charge. Mm -hmm. And sort of, like, redirects the question to that. Yeah. And manages to keep Cece from going back to the affair. Um, and Cece is so angry, he says he wants to run the entire Lockridge family out of town. He says he wants to know what's in that logbook. Book. He says, I'm going to wipe them out. And once again, he's completely being daffy about the fact that he can just go and grab the logbook. So again, we're seeing again, yet again, CC having a very sort of poor grasp of other people having ownership and claim on things. Mm -hmm. But Sort of like Emperor Palpatine. I yeah, wipe yeah. Wipe them out every last one of them. Well, this one was, this seemed to me it's kind <clears throat> of a little bit like, you know, King Lear or whatever who manages to alienate all of his kids and in this he's he's basically throwing a tantrum at all of them. He's, he's completely not going to forgive Mason and is just as upset with him as ever. He's against Ted having anything to do with Lakin. He's against Kelly still being with Joe and, and going her own way. And he's even and attacking, he's attacking Eden this, this episode. Yeah. So. Which is basically, um, I mean, he doesn't really know about, yeah, you know, that Augustus thing was true. So it's a, he suspects that it's kind of that contrast we were talking about though last episode, where Lionel's family is all rallying around, and Augustus trying to sell these paintings, and Lakin is having this huge, you know, crisis with Ted because she's not going to back down on supporting her dad and Orrin's running all around town trying to find Dominic and trying to find a way to clear his dad whereas CC is basically alienating his entire family. Now uh, Lionel tells Augusta to sell some paintings to raise his bail which is 500,000. Yeah. Uh, she goes to Elizabeth and very quickly begins to suspect that she and Lionel get along better than they make out. Elizabeth says, oh, no, he just had dealings with my father. He didn't pay me any attention. And Augustus says, well, that doesn't sound like Lionel. So I think she's very astute there. I think so. She knows So Lionel. they sell, I think, one painting to a Japanese buyer, and Cece storms in. It says, Elizabeth has betrayed him, and he will destroy all the Lockridges. So now, he's saying that in public places, too, now. Um, Lionel tells the media he was framed, which is something Dominic sees on TV. Um, Mason suggests he confess to avoid the death penalty. Um, Mason shows him the photo and the ring and the note uh, from the jacket. Now... If I were war, and Lionel, I wouldn't really want to put my fingerprints on this note, which isn't in an evidence bag or anything. Yeah. I wouldn't be just taking it from from Mason. And Mason also probably shouldn't be handling it. Um, and then Lionel starts to say that Tuxedo is Warren's before he realizes, oh no, 
tuxedo was worn. So even though he knows that Dominic has been hiding things, I guess he hasn't made the connection that possibly this note has been hidden in the tuxedo, and I think he suddenly thinks maybe Warren did kill Channing. All right, even, and I think even if he does take it a step further and, you know, think about the frame, mm -hmm. it is still ultimately Warren's tuxedo. Mm -hmm. And that so could he, probably be, yeah. that could possibly be proven somewhere He's definitely around. not going to tell Mason this is Warren's tuxedo. No, I, I so think. So I think he's going to take the fall for Warren. Yeah, I think he's going to just take the I think the he confession. needs to talk to Warren first, though, before he confesses. So well, dumb. I wonder, though, because Mason sort of, at the very end of the episode, he says, well, this is your last chance. And um, the bail's being raised, so Lionel's free to go. And, and his lawyer says, you know, I just need to t talk to, I don't know, I, I need to talk to Mason and tells him to just wait. And I actually think he might take the deal right away, just because Mason made it sound like that window was closing mm. today. So I think I think he might take it right away. That uh, makes it hard for me to see how the coming months are going to be. Because he, well, he would be out on bail, so. Yeah, but the deal would be him basically confessing to it. Mm -hmm. So he so wouldn't he be wouldn't able to go to bail. bail. He'd go right to jail. Yeah. So something else has to happen to keep Lionel from being in jail from the next foreseeable future. And that is it for this episode. Uh, one notable thing is that Margarita Cordova's credit was repeated mm -hmm. twice in the credits, and um, Santana is still in the credits. And those are the two notable things about the credits, and I think it was a new. Um, I don't think we've ever seen that scene of the over the yacht club, uh, with people moving, walking on the, the side the, the dock there, uh, over the credits before either. I don't recall that one. So that is it for episode one hundred eight. Um, we'll be back after we watch the final episode of week twenty two. The second last episode of the year, episode 109 of Santa Barbara. Bye. Bye. Welcome back. Hello. We've just watched episode 109 of Santa Barbara. Original air date, the 28th of December, 1984. Uh, which is, of course, when I was in Hawaii. I ran into someone from high school on the beach one day. Another day, my brother and I went scuba diving at Hanauma Bay. Mm -hmm. And that's where I learned to scuba dive 35 years ago. And the last time I scuba dived was actually 20 years ago, Christmas mm. of 99 in Cairns, Australia. Mm. So I've actually had the diving equipment in the cupboard for more years than I actually used them. <laughs> <laughs> On Santa Barbara, a show that I may or may not have seen, because it didn't really seem familiar, nothing really seemed familiar to me. Although maybe the, you might have actually been enjoying your I vacation. might have been out in the sun. Yeah. It could have been the drudgery of Amy Perkins that made me black, black the whole thing from my memory. Uh, Elizabeth, flirts with Brick at the museum. Jade and Amy notice this. Um, Amy leaves in disgust. Jade says to her, you're beautiful in a way. <laughs> and now that you're pregnant, that makes you very worldly. So, sage advice from Jade Perkins. Uh, Amy and Jade buy a used crib and start to repaint it. Uh, Brick shows up to help, notices it's wobbly, and Amy gets very annoyed with him and ends up uh, basically telling him to find another girl and kicks him out. Jade thinks that was a mistake. Brick then asks Augusta if women go crazy when they're pregnant. So, at one point, Amy says she doesn't think Brick is interested in her, which is odd, because... They go out on dates, and they kiss from time to time. Uh, so I'm not really sure where she gets that idea. I I have to admit that whenever Amy comes on, I sort of start reaching for my phone. Um, even, you know, I certainly am dedicated to, to watching the show, and so I, I put it back. But I, I do find um, the scenes with her to be fairly long. It's like she's in a completely different show from everyone else. Mm -hmm. It's like she's mm -hmm. in another soap opera 20 years earlier. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Augusta notices that someone is watching the house, which of course makes sense. There's a police officer tailing Lionel. Um, Lionel and Augusta ask Warren about his tuxedo. Of course, he doesn't know anything about it, about the note either. Um, they decide it's best if Lionel just pretends it was his, and they they burn Lionel's. Mm -hmm. So Lionel goes to the museum so that the police officer will follow him. Um, he tells Eden he didn't kill Channing, and she, she says she doesn't believe him. Then Cece shows up and uh, says, "Oh, I'm surprised you would show your face here with all the." You know, everyone in town hating you, and uh, Lyle says, well, you're sort of touch, everyone in town loves me, uh, and thinks I'm innocent. And Cece says he hopes Lionel gets the gas chamber, and that he gets to drop the pellets. So he's uh, on this rampage of killing Lockridge's still. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Warren and Augusta get uh, Lionel's tuxedo from the cleaners and burn it in the fireplace. So they didn't, as I predicted, decide to bury it in a cave, or shove it in Warren's jacket, so they've actually managed to get something and burn it within a very short period of time for once. Yeah, it didn't look like it was igniting very quickly. It was kind of lying on top of the fire mm. for quite a while, but... This may be just a special effects issue rather yeah, than a plot issue. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I but think it will get Mason, incinerated. If Mason shows up tomorrow and... That's right, if he finds en enough of the tuxedo to somehow identify it as Lionel's. Yeah. Um, then maybe the story would Warren could a still way. be in, in trouble, for sure. Or if he was Columbo, Mason would already have picked up the real tuxedo from the uh, dry cleaners and swapped it out for a fake one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't know if Mason's Columbo. No, I don't think so. And then Lionel uh, takes the opportunity of to ask Warren more about that night. So uh, we see the flashback we've seen before of Warren, Warren and Channing arguing in the study. Mm -hmm. and Channing puts the ring in the safe, I think, uh, which I hadn't really picked up on last time. Um, and uh, then uh, Lionel says, well, and then I know you came home and uh, tore your tuxedo because your mom saw that. And uh, what happened next? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, oh, then I went and got your gun. And it opens up the same drawer where they found all the clippings. This gun here that you always keep here. So, so it's a bit interesting new information. Yeah. that there was a gun in there that whole time that neither Mason nor the other police officers, you know, decided to take. I just saw the movie Richard Jewell, and they took all his guns uh, yeah. when they searched his house. So, Yeah, you would have thought that they might have had a bit more interest in that. If it was just lying there mm -hmm. all these years. Mind you, they didn't have a lot of interest in Minx's gun that she smuggled into the jail too. That no, could have that was... also been a match or whatever. It could have been useful. Mm -hmm. And we've seen Minx with a gun before mm -hmm. when Dominic broke in. So I don't know if, uh, how many different guns the locker just have mm -hmm. just uh, kicking around, but. Warren says he took the gun and he was going to go kill Channing. So he uh, returned to the Capwell house uh, by the back way through the garden and uh, snuck in the back door. And he uh, cocked the gun and opened the study door. And that was the cliffhanger. I assume he's going to say, and Channing was already dead. Yeah, that would be, that would make for an interesting timeline, actually, if that is what he says, because... We've already, it would have had to have been before Joe found him. Mm hmm And who else saw him dead? Was Did Peter say he had seen him Peter dead? Peter said he was already dead. Yeah. And there was a dark-haired man, but we don't we don't know if we can believe Peter's dark-haired man. If, if Peter may well have seen Warren and decided he still wants to make it seem like Mason might be the killer, so he said dark-haired man. Mm hmm um, But or yeah, there's definitely a potential that... Peter saw Warren with a gun in his hand in the study and Channing's body on the ground. Uh, and it still not be mean that Warren killed Channing. Well, and we, we know Mason had um, a confrontation with Channing because we've seen that flashback. And, of course, we've seen Lionel's as well. Mm -hmm. And Lionel's so, was before Channing's. Yeah. So did Lionel stay at the party? That we don't know because Warren came home. As far as we know, only Augusta was home. And then Warren went back, all without ever running into Lionel. Yeah, so so far, just thinking of the flashbacks, we've seen Peter have a flashback. 
We've seen Mason have a flashback. We've seen Lionel. And we've seen Warren. Mm -hmm. So the murder obviously happened after all those flashbacks. I'm not sure. Well, I don't think we've been told quite what order those flashbacks. Who saw him first? We know Lionel was first because he got the ring from Lionel. Mm. And then Warren saw him with the ring. So be between Lionel and Warren, we know Lionel was first and then Warren. And then what about Mason and Peter? Where would theirs have come I don't in? know. Because Mason thought he had seen the ring before. Mm. So it's possible Mason saw Channing after Lionel. Maybe, yeah. But before Warren, because he put it in the safe. Mm hmm So we'll have to kind of think through the timelines a little bit more. But it just, I guess the point I'm making is there would be a very finite amount of time, if that is what Warren's going to say, between all these different meetings and Channing getting killed and Joe finding him, because it always has sounded like Joe found him right away, but maybe he'd been lying there dead for a little while when Joe found him. Well, if Warren finds him dead, then that definitely add some time, mm -hmm. and I was pretty sure that Dominic and Joe heard a gunshot that originally drew them into the study, mm -hmm. but perhaps they either heard something else, or there was another gunshot for some reason. Yeah. So, we'll see what Warren says. If, it, yeah. if Channing was already dead, then that really adds some a huge chunk of time to the timeline that we didn't know about. Or is this... Maybe the study will be empty. Maybe Channing stepped out for a few minutes. We don't know quite what Warren will say yet. Mm-hmm. Because there is Warren a secret say, passage. Oh, I saw an open secret passage. And yeah, I went into yeah. It. So we'll find it. That's something I hope we find out right away next episode. Now, in addition to playing with Brick's hands and telling him he looks like exactly like Michelangelo, uh, Elizabeth also flirts a bit with Cruz in the Capwell study. Yeah, Elizabeth's flirted with most of the men on this show so far. Mm-hmm. Um, Cece shows up and asks Cruz to break into the museum and tell him what's in that log book. Uh, he declines and says that's something more like a CIA agent might do. Mm-hmm. He, of course, overhears, and when Cece leaves, she says, oh, that was a nice gag about a CIA agent. Uh, and she tries to flirt with him and get him to agree to break in, and he declines again. So immediately I started thinking, I bet Eden does it herself. Mm -hmm. uh, then we see Cruz dressed as a janitor, and he does another little character as he tries to get past the guards. Uh, I don't know if he actually is trying to get past them or just test them mm -hmm. to make sure that they're secure, because he knows now Cece's trying to send someone in after this book. Uh, they don't let him in. Mm -hmm. But of course... We see Eden sneak in with uh, the guard's uniform and change into it. And after Cruz leaves, she pops out and says to the security guards, Hey, uh, I'm supposed to take over for you. And they go, What do you mean, take over for us? And she says, Yeah, there's these two, there's five Miss American contestants at the airport and they need you to guard them. So this uh, works. They both leave uh, to go to the airport and give, hand the key to Eden. Now, it seems to me that protocol in this would be for them to phone either Lionel or, you know, whoever their, their supervisor, supervisor is at the at the security company and get this confirmed and that there would be some sort of a procedure in place for mm -hmm. for um, handing, you know, for changing the rotation or whatever. But uh, anyway, that doesn't happen. Yeah, so she walks right in and uh, we hear her voice over reading through some of the things uh, in the in the book, some of what uh, Elizabeth and Lionel have already read. She says, Nathaniel Capwell has stolen the emerald, and they're coming for us, February 8th, 1884. March 2nd, 1884, I know that Amanda has drawn a map showing where the emerald was hidden on the island, but since the death of Horatio, something, something. So now Eden's thinking, ooh, an emerald with a map. So I yeah, I'm Eden sure that'll be another adventure. This will be an adventure she can have. Yeah. Get some maybe she and Cruz stolen emeralds. Yeah. Uh, so as she's reading, we see Cruz sneak into the room and uh, put his hands over her eyes and say, "Happy New Year." Mm -hmm. And she said, "I'm going to kill you." Mm -hmm. So that is the last thing of the last uh, episode of this week. 
We have one episode left in the year, a Monday's episode for the 31st of January. So. And I, I have to admit, myself, I, I don't quite understand the full significance of this book. Mm. I mean, I could see where it could be used definitely um, to throw shade on the, the um, Capwells and that they wouldn't want that. But it just seemed to me that the insert they put in didn't really ass uh, obviously assign blame to uh, Nathaniel Capwell. Mm. So it didn't seem like that would be enough that they could claim the Capwells um, sunk, the ship. sunk the ship. And beyond that, it's really just quite an interesting historical document. So I'm not, you know, just my own my own observation is um, I'm not quite sure why everyone's bent out of shape over it. Mm, I don't remember the storyline at all, so I'll be yeah. interested to see uh, what actually comes of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we haven't checked in for a while on uh, who you think the next person will be to leave the show. Your last guess from both just after Santana left was a slow attrition of Perkinses. So does that still seem reasonable I'm, to you? I guess I'm hoping Amy will be the next <laughs> one to slowly, the but they seem to be n not letting go of the... I, I think basically they want to do something with Brick, which, and they've attached Amy to Brick right it now. It's like Perkins is a reproducing rather than reducing. Yeah, reducing. yeah. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't really see that as a thing. Um, I'm assuming that the Joe and Kelly storyline is going to continue on, although they've used Joe less and less. Um, and I would have thought maybe if they were going to phase him out and focus more on the Capwells that um, they would have sent him off to look for work for somewhere. So um, I'm just trying to think of the characters that have been sort of fading from view. Veronica was brought back. So I don't know. I, I don't have a good guess right now. All right, then we'll leave you at slow attrition of Perkins is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll see. Yeah. All right, we'll be back for the Monday episode to wrap up the year 1984, our first year of Santa Barbara, and the first year of Misha and Diane watch Santa Barbara. Hmm. Meanwhile, I'm going to enjoy Waikiki Beach. Bye-bye. Have Bye. a good weekend. The Santa Barbara Cemetery is home to numerous citizens of Santa Barbara's history. The first headstone to appear in the newly allocated Capwell Wing was Sophia Capwell, who was missing and presumed dead after a boating accident in 1969. Her headstone was joined by that of her son, Channing Jr., on the occasion of his untimely murder in 1979. Due to the events of the 1984 earthquake in Santa Barbara, it was revealed that Sophia had not succumbed to the events surrounding the boating accident, and she was revealed to be alive. Unfortunately, just hours later, the patriarch of the Perkins family, John Perkins would succumb to the injuries he received in his heroic rescue of fellow citizens trapped by the earthquake. Poor John Perkins should not have been in downtown Santa Barbara that day. He should have been on a cruise. We can only guess, but it is very likely that he and Marissa had tickets to the 35th anniversary cruise for their favorite childhood soap opera, 1949's These Are My Children. These are my children, 35th anniversary cruise. This is John and Marissa, watch. These are my children. John, however, had to miss that cruise because his son Joe had his parole revoked. John left Joe at the police station and went off to find a lawyer, leading him into the part of town where he received the injuries that eventually took his life. The only reason John Perkins was in that part of town was because he needed a lawyer for Joe. The only reason Joe needed a lawyer was because he had shot Peter Flint. 
The only reason he had shot Peter Flint is because Peter Flint was trying to kill him. And the reason Peter Flint was trying to kill him was that he was in love with Kelly Capwell. Everything I've done, I've done for Kelly, says Peter. I did it for Kelly. Everything I've done all along has been for her. Thus, were it not for Kelly Capwell, John Perkins would have been on that cruise. So we now inaugurate the Kelly Capwell Wing of Santa Barbara Cemetery, a very small section dedicated to those who would still be alive, if not for Kelly Capwell.